your side at UA, and I will be your host for the next hour. I'm glad you're joining us for the EOA webinar on universities and civic engagement. We got the impressive number of more than 530 registrations from across Europe and also beyond. So we can see that the interest is quite high and people are still coming in. So you were very welcome. With this webinar today, we are kicking off a new EOA webinar series of three webinars on universities and democracy how to strengthen a crucial relationship. Universities have, of course, existed for a millennium in very different political and social contexts. However, the EUA vision of universities without walls, of open, sustainable and autonomous institutions cannot really fully be fulfilled in non-democratic systems. It requires a free flow of knowledge in and out of universities the possibility to use evidence critically and the capacity of universities to make their own decisions. And we see democracy under pressure also in Europe, or by to different extent in different countries. The war in Ukraine is the most recent and extreme example of an attack on people and a country and their right to freedom and self-determination. But we do not even have to go that far or to go to this extreme to see that values of liberal democracy are being questioned. And with this also values of universities such as academic freedom and institutional autonomy are put under pressure. With this new webinar series, UA would like to look at what universities can actually do and how they contribute to open democratic and pluralistic societies. Today, we'll be focusing on civic engagement, what it actually entails, how universities can better engage with society and their communities, um, and also what new ways and formats are being used. So these are some of the questions we will explore, and of course, um, more also uh, during the discussion afterwards. What is civic engagement actually? There are different definitions. I would just like to quote one here at the beginning that I found in an article by Andre Sourstock, uh, UA senior advisor and our former deputy secretary general. She wrote about universities and civic engagement during the pandemic and said, typically civic engagement is local. It is usually includes things like service learning, community-based research, volunteer projects, initiatives aimed at economic and social development, community access to cultural events, facilities, and things like that. So to sum it up, um, in the essence, it's about things that connect the university to society, particularly to the local society. And it has a focus on social development, participation, and the well-being of communities. And I would like to add that it connects and overlaps also with other uh, terms such as social engagement or community engagement, public engagement, and we will hear more about this in one of the presentations later on as well. And with this, I would actually like to welcome my three speakers that are with me here today and that will share their perspective and expertise. We have Jana Bacevic, Assistant Professor at the Department of Sociology at the University of Durham in the United Kingdom. She will give an introduction to the broader theme of universities and democracy from the academic perspective. After that, we will hear from Ninoslav Schmidt, founder and executive director of the Institute for the Development of Education in Croatia. He will present a framework for community engagement in higher education that he is actually to develop together with partners in a European project. And that includes a toolbox for universities to frame and develop their activities. And then later we will dive into a concrete example with Pastora Martinez Samper, Vice President for Globalization and Cooperation at the Open University of Catalonia in Spain. She will share with us examples from her own university. And after the presentations, we will then have some time for discussion and should be finished around. I will do my best to select the, the questions for the discussion. 
And the intention is really that you get from the presentation some ideas that um, might inspire your work at your own university or you work with universities, um, depending on, on where you are in your own context, and that we can have a good discussion and exchange. But before you can all lean back and listen first, I would like you to be active. For this, we have prepared a, a small poll that is now visible to all of you on your screen. And you can answer it just by selecting one of the options and click on submit. And the question that I would like you to answer is, to what extent is civic engagement part of your university's culture and practice? Is it considered very important? Um, practice and valued across the university? Is it only important for certain parts or for certain people in the institution? Does it play rather a minor role or is it not really important at all? So what we are interested here is not so much what is written on paper in institutional mission statements and strategies, but really how are things done where you are? So about the culture. Yeah, we have about half of the people say that it's considered very important practice and valued across the university. That's pretty good. So we have very engaged institutions and uh, participants here today. Uh, this is, is really good. Um, and with that short exercise now being closed, we will go to our first speaker, Jana Bacevic. I hand over to you for the first presentation and for shedding a bit of light on the relationship between universities and democracy. Thank you, Annalena, and thank you to the EUA policy team for this invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here today and to be speaking to so many people. Um, I didn't dare look at the chat in part yet, in part because I was um, afraid of being intimidated by the diversity of the places and institutions and backgrounds that you come from. But I promise I will do that at the very end um, of my discussion and I look forward of my presentation. I look forward. Um, to discussion and the Q&A. So um, given that this is the first um, seminar in the EUA webinar series on universities and democracy, my idea was to give a bit of a background on the relationship between universities and democracies, something that has featured rather prominently in my research work from different perspectives, including focus on civic engagement, which other speakers will, as has been already said, talking about in more detail. So on the one hand, the relationship between universities and democracies seems logical, almost self-evident. Most of the universities we know today have been developed historically in order to serve the needs of modern contemporary nation states, most of whom are democracies. But the link is not as self-evident as it may appear at first. We can think about the relationship between universities and democracies in several ways. One is, do democratic societies give rise to democratic universities? The other is, do democratic universities give rise to democratic societies? And then, are universities themselves democracies? And why does this matter? So, Obviously, we would kind of think that um, democratic societies tend to make democratic universities, but the link is not so obvious. Some of the oldest universities in the world, which uh, I'm sure may surprise uh, any English members in the audience, but were not either Oxford nor Cambridge, uh, were actually founded in caliphates or in city-states. So namely, uh, the al Karwin University in what is today the Kingdom of Morocco, uh, the al Azhar University in Cairo in Egypt, and then obviously um, the Alma Mater University of Bologna in Italy. So they were not actually founded in democracies in any sort of way. They were founded in large territorial and political organizations, namely empires, and they had, however, which was quite ex exceptional at that point, relative independence from political power. And this brings us to the second point, which is whether once we establish universities as relatively independent from political power, those universities can develop or 
can help foster democracies. Now, obviously, the expansion of higher learning, especially in the aftermath of World War II, was coterminous, so happened at the same time as the expansion of liberal democratic models of governance across the world. Some of these links are obvious. Um, Large-scale participation in public, and especially in political life, requires obviously literacy, numeracy, as well as basic critical skills. But universities teach other things as well. For instance, they teach their members how to build consensus and how to accommodate and negotiate disagreement on multiple things from how to organize parking at universities, which, as I'm sure many of you will know, is always an issue, to, for instance, how to disagree on different social and political topics. This is all part of learning how to be an active citizen. But on the other hand, democratic universities do require democratic supporting structures. What does this mean? Universities themselves need to be run as democracies. What I mean by a democratic university is a university that has a strong component of collegial or academic governance, a strong student union or several student unions, obviously staff and student representation on all levels, and that's not only academic staff, as well as openness and different kinds of methods for resolving conflicts. Which brings us to the several other things that we are seeing today. One is that only strong and healthy democracies can afford to sustain strong and democratic universities. And that when democracies themselves encounter problems from populism and intolerance to open violence, universities mimic these problems so they cannot remain insulated from these problems. One of the examples I've been discussing recently with my colleagues and has been very prominent in the UK, but not only in the UK, are, for instance, disagreements about who can be platformed, so given uh, the right to speak at universities. But these disagreements are not only disagreements that are part of democratic governance or only disagreements about how universities should be run. There are also disagreements over standards of public and scientific discourse. And this brings us to the fact that these disagreements cannot be legislated or wished away. So as long as democratic societies exist, they are going to give rise to conflict and disagreement. So the question for universities is how they will resolve these kinds of conflicts and disagreements. And most importantly, can democratic universities continue to exist in societies they may not be democratic? For how long, obviously, and at what cost? And I do not mean only financial cost, in case that needs saying. Uh, we could also ask along similar lines whether non-democratic universities should exist in democratic societies. And why does it make sense to run universities as democracies? Um, I have placed these questions um, into, well, in this framework in order to stimulate discussion, but I will also give, um, I guess, an inkling of an answer in terms of what I actually think. And I think one of the things I would always argue for is that universities have to be run like democracies. And that, again, requires participation of all kinds of staff, as well as student in students in decision making. And I think that only this kind of university can continue to foster and continue to support the mission of a democratic society. That's it, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jana, for um, your presentation and for actually structuring a bit for us the relationship between universities and democracy, because indeed it's not so straightforward and the three dimensions that you showed us, I think are very helpful in conceptualizing a bit also the, the discussion uh, that we are gonna have and the red thread that goes through our webinar series. I would like to um, ask one question directly now before we go into the next presentation. You were saying that um, universities to a certain extent mimic what happens around them, which can mean that 
as democracy uh, is getting under pressure or, or getting attacked outside, this may also happen inside the institutions. And, and there is another question I see here in the Q&A published, what about universities as um, troublesome institutions? So can there also be something like, I suppose it's linked to uh, how universities can actually resist that development or not mimic it. So what do you think universities can and should actually do to sustain democracy also inside their walls? I think that is the key question. And um, it would be preposterous of me to claim that I have an answer to that. But one of the things that I do think is that universities should focus on making decision-making structures and that really concerns everything from, for instance, issues of divestment from fossil fuels in the context of the climate crisis to issues such as, you know, who gets to, who gets invited to speak, who gets appointed, uh, what kind of activities will the university engage in and so on and so forth. I think these decisions should be open to deliberation within the university because this is where we learn how to contribute to decision making. And obviously it would be a dream to think that much like in democracies more generically, that everyone will always want to take part and that everyone will always take part on equal terms. So neither are the case. But I think that as long as universities are not even open to this kind of possibility, the chances of universities fostering a democratic culture are pretty low. So in that sense, I would definitely say that, I was going to say it's easy for me to say that, but on the other hand, um, I would always encourage universities to foster democratic practices of decision making. And that is sometimes, I'm fully aware of that, very difficult. It is, as you've said, difficult both in context where the so-called surrounding society, so the social context is not necessarily very amenable or friendly to that, it is also difficult in, in situations where a non-democratic or perhaps a divisive context begins to reflect that kind of dynamics onto the university. So in that sense, I think we would always emphasize or we should always emphasize um, the values of respect and tolerance, but also agreement on what these principles actually mean in practice. And I look forward to hearing other people talk more about this because I'm really curious to hear about how we can actually foster civic engagement in the context of or the present um, day context of university governance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much um, for that. I think you made already an excellent transition to our next speaker, um, Ninoslav Schmidt, who will actually give us um, an example of, or, uh, of a framework that um, he developed uh, together with his project partners on how to frame and um, yeah, also capture community engagement in higher education and how institutions can practically do that. With that, uh, I hand over to you, Nino. Um, thank, for you. Thank, you. Uh, thank you, Anna Lena. So in my presentation, um, I will be speaking on what actions can be taken at European level to foster community engagement in higher education. At the beginning, I will explain the term community engagement, and then uh, I'll explain the uh, toolbox that we have developed for fostering community engagement in higher education. So community engagement is about how universities address societal needs in partnership with their external communities. And when we speak about communities, it could refer to a broad range of external university stakeholders like NGOs, social enterprises, cultural organizations, schools, hospitals, local and national government, even businesses. Uh, when we speak about the engagement, uh, it should be considered as a process whereby universities engage with community stakeholders to undertake joint activities that can be mutually beneficial and that 
can satisfy a range of societal needs like political, economic, cultural, social, environmental. So the needs that can influence quality of life in society. And then the question is about the terminology. Um, as you can uh, see, I use the term community engagement. Uh, we also have terms like civic engagement, uh, public engagement, and many other terms. But in my opinion, in essence, I think that all these terms uh, um, have a very similar meaning like the definition that I have just uh, described. We know that there are engaged professors, engaged teachers, engaged students, but the question is how to develop systematically community engagement in higher education. This approach uh, if we have a systematic approach, uh, it would allow universities to identify community engagement activities all across uh, university. It could help them understand how they uh, perform, and this approach could assist them in eventual improvement. So the question uh, here is, could a tool for measuring community engagement at universities help? But then, as you suppose, the question is how to measure something that is resistant of being measured. We know that community engagement is always context specific. We know that there is no one size fits all approach to community engagement. And we know that community engagement is notoriously difficult to measure quantitatively. So I'm glad to inform you that there are some new European initiatives to support community engagement in higher education. And here I will speak about two EU-funded uh, projects uh, that are proposing some new ways on how to measure community engagement. And uh, they are proposing European frameworks to support community engagement in higher education. So I'll speak about uh, what we call TEFC and SHEFC project, uh, two Erasmus Plus support projects. Uh, more information uh, you will be capable to find on tefc.eu and shefc.eu. But the important uh, thing is that in these projects, as partners, we have different universities and different community representatives, as you can see on the slide from really uh, all around uh, Europe. And our partners are also national governments, but also local governments, and then different European level organizations like European University Association, European Students' Union, Council of Europe, OECD, and some other organizations. Through the TEPSI uh, project, we um, have succeeded to develop uh, what we will call an alternative approach to measuring engagement. So um, the measurement that we have developed is qualitative. So we do not use metrics. Um, our me uh, measuring approach is multifaceted and context specific. So we do not strive to make comparison or ranking between universities. It's uh, participative, meaning that uh, it can go top down and bottom up. And uh, it is inspired by existing similar tools, but uh, we go beyond these tools. And that's why we believe it's an uh, innovative tool. And the result is what we call TEFSI Toolbox, which is an institutional self-reflection framework for community engagement in higher education. This toolbox at one side could serve as a reference tool for universities, communities, and policymakers to better understand the dimensions of community engagement in higher education. And on the other side, it could serve as a practical tool for universities to determine how well they perform as well as where they can improve. So let me just present briefly uh, our TEPSI uh, toolbox. As you can see, uh, the toolbox consists of four tools that are supposed to be implemented through five stages. Um, and the first tool, um, dimensions of engagement, uh, um, allow, we, we have seven uh, dimensions of community engagement in higher education. 
And these dimensions allow classification of community engagement activities that take place in teaching and learning, research, outreach um, related to policies for students, policies for staff, and also to different management policies. We have also developed um, uh, up to four sub-dimensions for each of these uh, seven uh, dimensions. Therefore, the second tool, levels of engagement, assigns, um, if you use this tool, tool you can assign um, levels of engagement to each sub-dimension, and they indicate the level of authenticity of community engagement, and it can range from beginner to advanced level. After we have developed these two tools, two additional questions came up. How to synthesize conclusions in a user-friendly way, and how to foster participative discussion among stakeholders. Therefore, uh, we have developed something that we call Institutional Community Engagement Heat Map, which is the third tool, and it synthesizes results of entire process of applying the previous two tools by indicating how developed is each dimension of community engagement according to five criteria. First, authenticity of engagement. Second, range of societal needs addressed. Third, diversity of communities engaged with. Fourth, extent of institutional spread of community engagement. And fifth, institutional sustainability of community engagement. And the result is a color-coded matrix uh, that synthesizes findings for each of seven dimensions, colors, and uh, the result could be, as you can see, on the screen. And the fourth tool uh, that we developed is something that we would call sleep dot analysis, but this is customized SWOT analysis without weaknesses, and it serves for the purpose of self-reflection discussions among university and community stakeholders on areas of strength, lower intensity, or areas for potential for development, as well as uh, for the discussion about threats and opportunities. These uh, five, uh, these four tools are supposed to be implemented through five stages. Uh, quick scan, uh, the collection of uh, in community engaged practices, and then mapping report, which is basically assigning uh, levels of engagement to different practices, then the participative dialogue, and that all results in an institutional report. We have piloted uh, the toolbox um, at uh, universities in uh, Germany, in Ireland, in uh, Croatia, and the Netherlands, and the process involved uh, more than 120 practitioners and 60 experts, and the results are the following. The toolbox proved to be comprehensive enough. Uh, it allows for context-specific solutions. It was empowering for participants. It has uncovered wealth of engagement activities at universities, and it offered insights about potential for improvement, and it was supported by management. So, as a conclusion, I can say that I am glad that we have developed a, a toolbox that could foster community engagement. Uh, and we know now that the toolbox could raise the visibility of the value the university brings to communities and vice versa. Also, the toolbox could support intrinsic motivation of community engaged staff, students and community partners. It also supports peer learning between institutions and uh, it provides really an excellent basis for action planning on how to improve uh, community engagement. Uh, if you will have any further question, please refer to our Institute for the Development of Education uh, in Croatia and also uh, to me. We will be glad to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Anna, Lena. Thank you very much, Nino, um, for this presentation and for giving us a bit of an idea how to actually frame more the topic of community engagement, all the different activities that universities can do around this. I have 
two questions for you, I think, right away. And the first one would be, you said something, I think, that we hear quite often in discussions about um, measuring the impact of university activities. And that's not only linked to community engagement, also in the discussion about research impact, we hear this. You said it's notoriously difficult to measure uh, community engagement and, uh, yeah, the impact it might actually have. Why do you think it's nevertheless worth to maybe not measure it quantitatively, but to frame it in the way you did uh, with your framework or with your toolbox? What, what's the added value actually for, for universities um, to, to do it in that way and to look in that way at their activities? Thank you, Annalena, for the question. Uh, uh, I, I would say that first benefit of applying the toolbox and then the measuring community engagement in a way that I have described, it will uh, raise the visibility uh, of different community engagement activities that are already taking place at the university. It will then support intrinsic motivation of uh, community engaged staff, students and partners, and then it would definitely empower them to be even better uh, in community engaged activities. Also, it will uncover wealth of uh, engagement activities that are taking place at the university that maybe uh, are not visible through the toolbox. They will become uh, visible and it will offer insight about um, potential for improvement, which means it will provide an excellent basis on how to uh, uh, make an action plan for community engagement. Anna so Lena? Actually very much, yeah, supporting the, the university and the community in their development with an enhancement-based approach. Um, as a follow-up to that, we look now at the institutional sort of side, but how can actually public policy uh, best support universities in their community engagement. Do you have ideas for that as well from your project? I would say that uh, policy tools best suited to support community engagement in higher education should focus on building capacities of higher education institutions for engagement and on facilitating a learning journey rather than on compliance or uh, competition. So from top-down approach, it would mean to have more policy statements supporting community engagement or second, to create tools for transnational learning and capacity building. For instance, to create a platform for connecting universities that are community engaged. And maybe third, um, through incentives and funding. So for instance, maybe to incorporate community engagement into existing EU funding programs. And on the other side, from bottom-up approach, it could mean build a network of European higher education institutions committed to community engagement, or second, to connect with existing European level institutional networks and ensure discussions on this topic within European level organizations such as the EUA. And lastly, to build other alliances and scale up, it is possible, for instance, to connect it uh, to the agenda of the European universities initiative. So if we would combine top-down and bottom-up approach, we could create a European movement for community engagement in higher education. And I believe such a movement could then foster this uh, policy in the longer term. Thank you very much. I think you've given us already plenty of ideas sort of for possible follow-up initiatives. We, I think we may come back to that as well in the discussion uh, after all the rounds of presentation. But uh, now we go from the level of the framework um, more to the concrete institutional example. And for this, I'm very happy that we have with us Pastora Martinez Samper from the Open University of Catalonia, who will now tell us a bit about her institution's strategy and also give us some concrete examples of programs and activities you're having. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you very much, Annalena, and thanks a lot to the EUA for inviting the, the Open University of Catalonia to share the work we've been doing along these years. 
and in particular to choose or to include you know, the work that can also be done thanks to digital technologies, because for those who don't know the UOC, uh, we are a fully online university that was created uh, just two days, uh, two years after the World Wide Web went public. So in that sense, it's interesting because the work that we've been doing in terms of civic engagement uses sometimes different strategies that the ones implemented at physical campuses. And in that sense, for instance, that, that idea that you mentioned at the beginning, Anna Elena, uh, saying that uh, civic engagement is local uh, is not always the case. Um, so let me just start by saying um, that although we are talking about uh, uh, university engagement no, but we must stress here that university communities are already engaged communities and we must not forget that climate emergency is a very good example so we have this uh, very big civic movements um, such as fighters for future that grew up from students community but we don't have just um, a student uh, we also have academics that are also part of all those uh, civic uh, movements. No? Um, so here, the, the important point to be uh, now stressed here, or at least in my presentation, is why all these movements were created outside university campus. So uh, why all these mobilizations happen outside the institution? And um, here, for us at the UOC has been the point of reflection and also the starting point from our uh, strategy um, this somehow this connection between the university community and the institution uh, and we 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 must address it uh, is of, as universities we want to have a decisive role in our societies and another important point was also already mentioned by nino uh, is that we must not forget we're talking about civic uh, engagement in universities that we must engage not only with university communities but also with the other communities that are part of the societies we live in. So in order to do so at the university, at the Open University of Catalonia, so what we aim is to transform our closed university uh, into a, we call it a, a, an open knowledge hub. So in somehow porous, more porous universities that can catalyze the efforts, but also the needs, the will, and the work that all these communities are doing. So merging both the inside and the outside of all these, um, all these needs. So, and for doing so, and now I'm going to the policies, for doing so at the UOC, we, we decided in 2016 to take the 2030 uh, Agenda for Sustainable Development um, as an opportunity to make things happen. No? And we took it because it addresses the main, the main global challenges um, that we are facing. It remember us that we can not solve them working alone or in silos. So we must work all together in order to solve them. And also because for the first time in an international political agenda, um, equal access to higher education and lifelong learning is it is included. Also research is key for finding those solutions and the, the sharing of the knowledge is also, is also very important. And in fact, there's a very nice report uh, published in 2019, uh, which is called The Future is Now, um, Science for Achieving the, the SDGs, which also says that we need as academic institutions to transform ourselves in order to make everything um, that we want in those terms uh, happen. So at the UOC, what we've done is to integrate uh, the 2030 agenda within our um, strategy plan. And we have it also in the new strategic plan uh, for the next years to come. Um, and as a one of the best instruments, if we can call it an instrument, that we've taken to make it happen is the all related with the open science movement. And we in 2018, we approved 
our open knowledge action plan. Uh, we have different uh, specific areas of work, and one is this open to society, but with this idea of a porosity and a bilateral um, flow of ideas and, and people and, and communities. Um, yeah, but to be more concrete, I've chosen two examples of this civic engagement and what we've been doing. One more focused on teaching and the other one more in research. And then let me start with um, the works Refugee Welcome Program. And I choose it because um, it came up from uh, an idea uh, from a group of our students um, that they mobilized themselves um, and wanted to do something about the humanitarian crisis uh, we had at that moment in 2015, 2016, uh, with the war in Syria uh, in the Mediterranean area. And they came to us, to the university, with this call for action. So we decided to work we decided to work together, the, the globalization and cooperation team and this group of students, and we set up a pilot at the Greek settlements of refugees in order to understand what were the needs and what can or could as uh, the UOC provide them. And we, we saw at that moment that uh, we as an online university, we could um, give them access to, to follow the, their courses or some of the courses. And we started with this pilot in, in 2017. Then we open it uh, and learn how to do it better. And we uh, take all the um, other uh, applications from other refugees already in Spain, but also in the Sahara, for instance. Uh, and since 2018, this call, uh, that's something we learn, is, is made together with social entities that are also helping um, refugees and asylum seeker people uh, to, to be uh, yeah, integrated in, in our different societies and cities. Um, so basically the, the program has a specific mission, which is to give access to higher education, which is not always covered by um, mechanisms from other administrations. And the program gives them uh, and covers the full tuition, but also gives them some support in terms of academic guidance and, and um, personalized mentorship. And this mentorship is done by the work university community. So it's student, alumni, but also um, academic and, and, and administrative staff that are involved in that. And it also helps us a lot to raise awareness within our uh, work community on that. Um, the program in, fig in figures is that we have more than 180, uh, 180 scholars uh, in total for now that has uh, had those postgraduate courses and also language uh, courses. Um, more than 150 mentors from the work community. And something that is very important for us um, uh, talking about commitment is that we fund this project uh, thanks to the, the charitable enrollment um, contributions from the students in their tuitions. So basically, to give you the, the numbers of this, uh, um, of the profile of this scholar, most of them are asylum seekers. They don't have uh, already this um, condition of refugee, the, the legal um, paperwork done. Uh, we have parity of men and women. They are aged. They are older than the traditional students. Most of them live in Spain, but some of them live abroad. As I said this is an advantage of the of the online uh, teaching methods, and half of them have already a bachelor degree. And, and so we've learned a lot in all those six years of the program, and we've learned that um, for the scholars in the program. This um, gives them the motivation to 
continue study, but also favor them the, the inclusion in society and this sense of belonging. It also is very interesting for the work community because they, they want to participate in the program. And we are also collaborating with social entities, uh, which uh, collaboration is crucial in order to give them the psychological, no, psychosociological stability they need for students. But we as university, the institution also, we've learned a lot. Uh, we've learned a lot about our role to create these uh, adequate conditions and support uh, um, to make all those things happen in a more systematic way, as Nino was mentioning before. And the other, the second and last project is a project that comes from a research group in our institution. And this research group uh, created this decidin.org, uh, which is a digital um, platform for citizen participation. So they created for the uh, Barcelona City Council some years ago, this uh, free open source participatory tool uh, when the Barcelona City Council decided to make their participatory um, uh, budget. Uh, now, this tool is used uh, by the European Commission, by more than 20 regions, no? the, not just Catalonia, but for instance, also Assemblée Nationale Française, uh, by more than 40 uh, cities, not just in Europe, but also in America, and by more than 20 organizations. Some of them are universities, and for instance, at the UOC, our last uh, strategic um, a plan was also uh, elaborated thanks to this to this tool in order to know all the uh, ideas and contributions from our community and in fact they have a um, an award i i picked this project because i think that we also as university we have the means the tools and the knowledge in order to help to make uh, this participatory citizen participatory tools and landscape to grow and we have also responsibility on that and with this thank you very much for your attention thank you very much pastora for um presenting these very concrete um examples to us as well both from the learning and teaching and from the research side and i think what your presentation illustrates very well is the connection between the overall institutional strategy, in your case, connected to the sustainable development goals, and then the concrete examples of various activities. I would call that a good practice example, actually, because what we've noticed um, from our early work we did on the topic of public engagement back in 2019 um, is something a bit different. It's actually I remember um, we had a focus group actually at your place in Barcelona where we met with um, people from across Europe to discuss about public engagement of universities. And what we noticed in the discussion is that it's very often um, driven by very committed individuals, bottom up level initiatives at the universities, but they are not necessarily connected to an overall institutional strategy and not necessarily um, everyone in, in the institution is also aware of this. So um, from your perspective, what do you think, to, to what extent is it important that there actually is a connection between the institutional strategy and the activities? Because one could say, you know, it's nice if they flourish bottom up, what do we need that connection? What is the advantage from, from your um, experience? That there's no way to do it uh, disconnecting both the, the top down and the bottom up. Um, um, if um, from the, the, the top down we don't uh, articulate and put the, the, the need tools, but also the policies and support, everything will remain disconnected and everything will still be uh, individual wheels and, and actions. So if we want really to have a real um, porous civic university, the, the policies at the university models should incorporate everything and not just the narrative. The narrative is important, but the policies and the support is key. So yeah, mm, 
for me, for us here, that both things should be together because not is is very difficult to make them flourish. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think with that, I would like to open the discussion and ask Nino and Jana to also come back in um, because we still have some time to take also some of the questions up from uh, the chat and from the Q&A section. Jana, if you are there as well, could you? Yes, very good. Switch on your camera. Um, and I would actually like to come back a bit to one of the questions that was put very early in the chat and which may also be a little bit provocative maybe. <laughs> to what extent um, do you actually think that fostering active citizenships of students and staff is actually the responsibility of higher education? That what was how I phrased the question in the chat. Someone wrote, um, are we actually not putting too much too high expectations on universities with asking them to engage in all of that? Can they solve the political societal problems we have with that? Do we have to learn that already much earlier in school? Sort of what is that a responsibility of universities? Please, whoever wants to start from your side, come in. I'm happy to give a, a sort of a perfunctory answer to this uh, by actually citing something that uh, you and Elena and Nino as well have said, which is that when we aim to measure what universities do, we often by definition assume that what we measure, what we end up measuring is the product of universities own work and engagement. And in that sense, I would on the one hand, absolutely agree that um, ex expecting universities to foster active citizenship is perhaps too tall an order. It is too much to ask, um, in part because universities are not the only institutions within society, and in part that in some ways is just um, expecting of them to perform a role that they were neither designed to uh, nor necessarily best equipped to do. But then on the other hand, I would always say drawing on my own work and some of the stuff I have raised in my presentation, it is often really about universities creating spaces and situations where both students and staff can engage in democratic citizenship. So it's not necessarily a question of actively fostering it as well as actively making sure it's not prevented so that when they do want to engage with it, they're not prevented from doing so. And obviously, I do think universities can and should do much more. But I think at the very least, what we can hopefully expect universities to do is to support these initiatives when they actually come about. Because obviously, um, a lot of this will not be institution driven as much as institution enabled. Mm -hmm. Anyone else would, yes, Nino, please. Very briefly, just to mention that I have answered this question and some other questions in the chat. Uh, we have included active citizenship in our toolbox under the dimension of outreach, because we believe uh, that the university could foster uh, active citizenship. And I think that the needs nowadays uh, with the raise of undemocratic tendencies could definitely help and then uh, the university uh, could uh, somehow foster this transition from co collaborative betterment to collaborative empowerment uh, of uh, citizens uh, that the university see is engaged with may, yes. may i uh, yeah just adding of what my colleagues already mentioned that we, we, we talk about a lot about this third main mission of the universities, right? And we talk a lot that we must uh, teach our students uh, about critical thinking and so on. So being disconnected from societies um, is somehow strange. So I, I, I understand that universities are not the only ones responsible for that but should assume uh, some responsibility on that and for sure we should start 
before schools and, and high schools, but universities here, we do also have a role. Mm -hmm. I think that links uh, back to one last question, I think, for which we still have time. There were actually two different people asking once about how to embed civic engagement in uh, learning and teaching, but also how to take account of it in research. Do you have a short answer to that? It opens a whole new discussion. We could have probably a whole webinar about just that, but maybe you have a short answer. Yes, Dino? There was one question uh, uh, about it. It can be fostered through, for instance, service learning. Uh, this is the component where, uh, I mean, we included uh, service learning under the learning and teaching dimension of uh, our toolbox. And uh, I think that Pastora has uh, explained uh, engaged research and how, for instance, open science and science shops could foster uh, civic and community engagement. But maybe Pastora would like to add something to this. Yeah, thank you, Nino. Yeah, I think that everything related with the open science movement and also including citizen science here has a lot to tell us, no? So maybe this is the, the best way to approach or how do we include uh, this citizen engagement, civic engagement in research. In teaching, there are many different ways. Maybe uh, another uh, adding to the one that mentioned Nino uh, could be in the in the um, works that should be done. No, uh, I can't find the word in English. Sorry, now, but uh, those all those works that uh, the students should be done at the end of the degrees. Um, this could be done in collaboration with third entities and not only uh, academic uh, paperwork, but create these um, questions and the answers with, with other entities. Diana, yeah. And I'll just add very briefly to that. Um, I would always say one of the ways in which we can foster uh, civic engagement through teaching, learning, as well as research is giving the space and the opportunity of for those who are engaged in these practices to design their own modes of engagement so and to work on them collectively because i think one of the main ways in which we learn civic engagement is by learning to cooperate and collaborate with others so in that sense i would always say you know design courses that do not involve only individualized assessment um, design group tasks give people the opportunity to reach out beyond the university, um, beyond their own comfort zones, um, and obviously uh, recognize and reward that when it happens. Thank you very much. I think this was actually a very good conclusion of that learning how to collaborate and how to, um, yeah, actually foster this also through the way um, we design the different um, activities in the different mission of universities. Thank you very much. Um, with that, we are actually already close to the hour, just one minute before three. Uh, and with that, we are already at the end of our first webinar today. Thank you very much to the speakers, Jana, and Nino and Pastora for presenting us your ideas, project and your expertise. Um, and many thanks also to all of you, the participants, for joining us today and participating very lively in the chat and also asking questions via the Q&A. Um, we will make this webinar available on the EOA YouTube channel, so you can listen to the recording again afterwards. And also the presentations will be made available on, on the website and some further material that the speakers have shared with us. So in case you want to read a bit further or look up one of the examples or the toolbox that Nino presented as well, you're welcome to do so afterwards. As I said before, this was only the first in a series of three webinars of universities and democracy. On the 14th of June, we will explore another aspect of this crucial relationship in the second webinar, where we will talk about fostering scientific literacy, universities, and the future of science communication. 
And two weeks later, uh, with the third webinar on the 28th of June, we will speak about contributing to evidence-based policymaking, universities and science advice in times of uncertainty. If you're interested to join, you can register as usual via the EOA website. And with that, I wish you a good afternoon. And thank you very much. Hope to see you soon again. Bye.